change. Now this exchange began a few years ago when uh, on CNN News, um, one of our very generous donors uh, was watching and saw the refugees leaving from Macedonia and Albania and Montenegro. And he called up Dartmouth Medical School and said, Joe, we've got to do something. We've got to help those people there. And what we did was we got together a small group of people and tried to decide what we could do. And what we came up with, with which I think was a very innovative project, was what we tried to do was try and support the medical school that was rebuilding itself in, in Kosovo. And it's been an outstanding project. The biggest thing we've had is a student exchange. And we have uh, the Kosovar students coming here to spend time, and our students from Dartmouth Medical School going there. And what we gain from both sides is just incredible. Um, I, when I was uh, thinking about this, I was thinking about a speech that Václav Havel made uh, before a joint session of Congress. He was invited to talk about the things that had happened after the Green Revolution in Czechoslovakia. And he came to a joint session of Congress and he said to, the, to everybody in there, he said, um, we have a lot to thank you for. We have a lot that, to, that you are going to help us with. You're going to help us with educating our children and rebuilding our economy and a whole bunch of different things. But you know, you have something to gain from us, too. Uh, when you've been under the oppression of communism as we have, under the rock of oppression of communism as we have for so many years, you get a chance to think and reflect and think about what's important. And let me uh, tell you what we can give you, what we think is important. And he said, you know, the salvation of uh, the human race really lies in the human heart. It lies in the human ability for connection. It lies in love. It lies in uh, us getting together, being able to get together. Um, he got a standing ovation from that, uh, from that joint session of Congress as if they understood exactly what he meant. Uh, but I think we here are getting to understand what he means because uh, we, are, we are gleaning, so we are gaining so much from uh, the visitors who come here from Kosovo and how they are rebuilding their medical system, their medical education system. Uh, and it's a wonderful inspiration to us. And it's a wonderful thing to be part of it. And now uh, I'd like to introduce to all of you Ghani Abazi, who's a uh, uh, fifth year medical student in the six year program at University of Pristina. And he has put together uh, what I think a, a program that you th I think you'll all enjoy about Kosovo, um, the past, and the, the future. Um, so thank you very much for, and welcome Ghani Abazi to Dartmouth Medical School. Thank you for uh, dear professors, Dear doctors, dear students, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm, uh, I feel very honored and privileged to be here tonight with you and pass uh, forward a presentation from my country, who sadly had to pass through some difficult times. And uh, uh, I feel honored for that, and I will try to do my best in order to be as much open to any question that might come from the audience and just uh, to let the, the people know about what has happened and what the future might be. And uh, we as young people are very concerned about our country and uh, the future there. So uh, we want to share our ideas and also what uh, in the future we can improve there. And uh, I've heard a very nice saying, and actually an article here uh, by a famous doctor called Dr. Strickler, where he said that we cannot have in the global world uh, if we don't go to the diseases to cure them, they will come to us. So I use this chance and uh, just sh uh, share with you what's wrong in Kosovo and what could be improved in order to have some feedback in the future. So we start now. And uh, this presentation may, uh, because of technical uh, problems, it may have an unexpected thing, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. This presentation will be divided in three parts. The first part is the Kosovo before the war, which will uh, uh, cover the last uh, 10 years. Then we will go to Kosovo during the war. We will briefly mention the main events that happened at the time. Then we will focus more on the future. And we will uh, 
pay special attention to education, rehabilitation, integration of minorities, and the uh, economical development. So Kosovo is found in Southeastern Europe. Uh, uh, here are some statistics. I also will apologize that uh, the presentation may seem a little long, so uh, some information, unrelevant information might be skipped. So Kosovo's population is in women in the sense. We have Albanian around 90%, Serbs around 7%, and then Bosnia, Turkish, Romans, and Croatians, and so on. Capital is Pristina. Uh, this is uh, some maps of Kosovo. The neighbors are Serbia in North and North East, Montenegro, Albania, and former Republic of Yugoslavia. Now the background of Kosovo. Till 1974, uh, Kosovo was uh, part of, uh, Ser uh, of uh, Yugoslavia, but at the same time part of Serbia. But uh, because uh, Kosovo was the only country of part that was uh, violently forced in, uh, uh, included in Yugoslavia, uh, the, the people there didn't have many rights, and uh, actually they didn't have the right for education and uh, many other rights on uh, employment and so on. So it happened in 1968, there happened many demonstrations in Pristina, and uh, Josip Broz at the time visited Kosovo, so he decided to make some changes on the legal framework of, uh, of Kosovo. And uh, after 1974, there happened some uh, changes in the federal constitution. So uh, Kosovo became one of the eight parts of Yugoslavia with a, a, a substantial autonomy at the time. But the revocation of autonomy happened uh, in 1989 when uh, Milosevic got the power in Serbia. And then uh, uh, there happened uh, a lot of uh, troubles in, initially in Kosovo and then in all over Yugoslavia. Uh, some characteristics of, characteristics of Kosovo uh, as, the former, uh, as a part of former Yugoslavia were that it was the only part forced to join Yugoslavia by military violence, <coughs> and the population were not slaves, uh, Slavs, and uh, Kosovo Albanians have been the least integrated population. We had the highest unemployment, we were the poorest federal part, despite the nature of wealth, and we had the highest illiteracy rate. That is because we were denied to have uh, right from education. And uh, after the occasion of autonomy, uh, there have been some measures taken by the regime, Milosevic regime. Initially, they started in the uh, military, uh, Yugoslav military forces. Uh, there were many Alba young Albanian uh, soldiers serving there, so they were coming uh, with a report of suicide that nobody believed. There were more than 50 of them were killed. Then we have the poison of uh, children. And uh, you can find about this in this uh, book, also many other books. And also UN was involved in the time. And we had detention of treatments. But the uh, Albanian population responded to a peaceful resistance. So we established the Democratic League of Kosovo in the time. Uh, which was uh, the main mission was to evade uh, peaceful resistance and not to let the people go in war with uh, Serbs and with the Yugoslav regime. And uh, they went in peaceful protests all around, uh, all around uh, Kosovo. So these are some protests taken in Pristina at that time. And uh, they cultivated uh, the trust that uh, the international community will bring justice in Kosovo. So they went on with protest, but the uh, response was like this. They used violence, the military and police violence. And we have then afterwards uh, some administrative measures like uh, education again. In 1970, 1970, there was uh, for the first time established the uh, Pristina's University. Uh, uh, on Albanian language, but that uh, after that, uh, Milosevic wanted to take it uh, back again. So they imposed the Serbian curriculum, which was uh, roughly used by the Albanian population. And uh, in the years 1990, 1991, then they happened a bit of Albanian population from the schools and the universities. 
and then afterwards uh, people were forced to sign in, uh, an act of loyalty towards the regime, which was refused. And because of that, the regime kicked uh, the people out of their job places. And uh, they started initially in the University Clinical Center of Pristina, and they went on in other places. And uh, then they implemented a kind of police state. Uh, they put many uh, police checkpoints, and uh, uh, there were the number of military and special troops was the highest in Yugoslavia at the time. And the uh, Albanian people established the concept for protection of uh, human rights in the times, and uh, which disseminated collected facts and disseminated them throughout all the world. So these are some uh, statistics of the time. These are some photos of uh, Serbian special police who was going in the villages to make uh, search for for weapons. And uh, the Albanian people went on with the protest uh, until the, the Serbian violence was become so severe that uh, many killings and uh, mistreatments of uh, young people happened and everybody who was participating. So the peaceful resistance of the time said that we have to uh, stop these peaceful protests because we have to save the lives of the people. And, uh, uh, then we had the educational system that uh, went down, but we established our own parallel educational system, which was, uh, I think, the sole example in the world. We, uh, all these students and pupils, they went underground, and uh, uh, they, they used bar uh, garages and private homes as schools. Financing was done on a volunteer basis. And uh, we had teachers and students many times completed. I mean, when they called books in Albanian or something like that, they, they beat the people or arrested because they called it a, an illegal university against the Yugoslav state. But we established a social life of solidarity. So, in a, on education and medicine, uh, this uh, solidarity helped crucially the population to survive and to function. Uh, so we established our medical system, which was out of the buildings, of course, for the association. And the uh, voluntary activities operated in all over Kosovo. And there were three pillars that the peaceful resistance was based on. There was a refusal to be provoked, social solidarity, and seeking international support. And we established our own government in exile, but it could not function in Kosovo and the center was in Bonn, in Germany. But life in Kosovo was becoming harder and uh, people didn't uh, go anymore in protest uh, because there was a rough violence happening against them. So uh, then we had many interrogative meetings because these police forces, they were taking care of anything suspicious that was in Kosovo at the time. And as a consequence, we had a very big exodus of Albanian population. Initially, they started to, I mean, they didn't want to go in war in Bosnia and Croatia, they started to live that. And they, uh, some of them uh, were persecuted for becoming members of LDK or this uh, Council for Protection of Human Rights. And others had for economical reasons because there was, uh, the unemployment was very high. And uh, the roots were initially in Europe and uh, they, Initially, it was quite easier to go. Uh, European countries didn't close the borders in the time. But after that, they closed the borders and uh, refugees went in illegal rules. And we had a, a tremendous solidarity between Albanians. Even when that was against the state or against the rules, they were just, I mean, going and help refugees to pass illegally. Uh, but we had them, uh, many, many young people shot there, especially in Czechoslovakia. Czech Republic, Austria, Albania, Italy, and so on. And the uh, refugees went where they could find a job, they could find some support, or they could be easily adapted. So the biggest number of them went to Germany, because the uh, 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 easiest way to find a job, but also in other countries of the world. And later on, they went in all over the world. You cannot find any place in the world where you cannot find Albanians living as refugees. But the Western behavior 
have changed. We had a, a huge number of Albanians in the time, uh, and according to Wall Street Journal, it was 650,000 people in the year 1987. But we had this anti refugee feeling that began to uh, be present in some European countries. And uh, we had also some Albanians who uh, did uh, bad things in those countries. There were some individuals, but they uh, destroyed quite a lot of Albanian image. And the integration programs were not good, no way to socialize them. And the Western media during the elections, they played a very bad role, the same as will they found that they, I mean, in order to make some more votes during elections. And then Germany signed a readmission agreement in October 1996. They, uh, after the Dayton agreement, they were thinking that Milosevic won't kill anymore and they can now return the Albanian refugees from Germany. And uh, although they knew well about that what happened in Sobrinitsa and Croatia, they signed the agreement and they agreed to return about 170,000 Albanian refugees in Kosovo. You can find more in the links that are written there. And uh, there is a question if uh, this was an act against the human rights. Many human rights organizations say yes. And uh, this was accepted by Yugoslavia only when they accepted the large amount of money and the economical beneficence after some sanctions were taken off. And Germany received many international critics, but it, the government didn't care at all. So we, uh, uh, Milosevic uh, uh, regime, they declared a kind of amnesty for these refugees who before, years before that, they fled. But that was not respected. There were refugees being maltreated and being uh, detained. And we had also cases of being killed. So you can find more on the links that are there. But uh, what will happen in Kosovo after these people come back? Uh, there were many uh, 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 people saying that their tensions will raise. And this was true because these people couldn't be adapted in Kosovo. They were used with uh, Western democracy, and uh, they didn't seem to, uh, to adapt anymore. So the students started first. In Dayton agreement was written that uh, the, uh, the schooling should be, be available for the Albanian population in Albanian language, but uh, Milosevic uh, never respected that. So students now went to protest. They uh, said that we will organize protests and uh, we won't have a school staff. So in Christian October 1st, 1997, students made a huge organization, uh, very well, well organized, and uh, they said that we will go for work to send you our, send for work to issue for education. But we had international diplomats and also Albanian diplomats say that the status quo will be pressure and we should not go in the project because we may have a, then the, situa the situation might blow up and we will have war. The students didn't care actually. They said that they were protesting with books and they were saying that it's our legitimate right. Uh, so they went home, but the police blocked the roads and the protests were organized in all over Kosovo at the time. And uh, students were very organized. This is the scheme of our university. There were a limited number of slogans. But uh, the uh, police response was like this. They beat the students in Pristina and then all over Kosovo they, when they called this kind of protest. And uh, many people were injured, some of them put in prison. And uh, arguing with power, uh, it will work or will not, we'll see. So these are some photos taken from CNN. And the students' leaders were arrested together as the director of the university. And uh, the situation in Kosovo changed. So there were more checkpoints. Students uh, were, uh, uh, were committed to go on, no matter what happens. But they were using violence and, uh, I mean, imprisoning students, but they didn't care. I mean, they couldn't imprison all of them. 
we see some photos of the students all the time. Yeah. And then the population joined. Afterwards, also some politicians who initially objected. So the youth was in the front, students in the front, but then yeah. older people and politicians joined. We had an uh, increase of protests almost each week, but also more violence, more imprisons, uh, imprisonments and uh, killings. These are two Albanian politicians of the time who joined the students of the population. And these are some photos taken on March uh, 1998. So the photos were very massive. Because it was all the population who was against the regime. And then uh, uh, the police and military uh, Serbian forces, they intensified the campaign. These are some photos taken all the time. So it was used uh, military machinery, and uh, we had uh, students arrested, and also a professor Montijo. He's a professor of surgery in our medical school called uh, Dr. Uh, Aliza Pichi. And we had also international general Stephen who were, were there to report what was going on. But now we passed in the second part, uh, which is quite short actually. So uh, during the war, uh, now when people started to think, they said that we, with this peaceful resistance, we will go nowhere. I mean, nobody will take care of us. We have to take care of ourselves. So a new organization was uh, established. That was the Kosovo Separation Army, and who showed the public in February 1998. They said that we will fight back. And uh, then we had uh, more and more young people, and more students, and all over all the population actually joining as much as they could. But it happened that this army was not optional enough in order to fight back because there were the people who were uh, untrained as much as they needed for, to, to start the war. We had also refugees who were in all over the world who joined. So we were had refugees coming also from Albanian people coming from the United States and Germany and England and all around. They were went initially in Albania and they, they made their military camp there. But uh, still they couldn't be trained well. This is tourists uh, sitting in Albania and uh, uh, people coming with the sheep. So this army was not professional enough because it came from the people. It didn't have any academy or something like that. And we had the, the young people, the impatient ones, the people who wanted to uh, fight by heart but not by professional means, being uh, sacrificed uh, in the battle and the, in the border and by landmines and so on. But uh, the Serbian forces, they intensified in their campaign in Kosovo. They now started to burn houses and sell the population. So this is a photo taken from CNN. We see a special police uh, policeman in, a, in an Albanian village. And this was called ethnic policing of the campaign. And the uh, Serbian forces, and actually the regime, the propaganda was saying that there are the Albanians who killed the Albanians themselves. But uh, the international journalists, they discovered that it was actually the regime and the military and paramilitary forces who did the burning of houses and killing of innocent people, mostly civilians. So this uh, village uh, in central Kosovo called Prekas, and uh, actually the war started initially there. But we had the uh, diplomatic efforts uh, underway in order to solve the uh, problem with peaceful means. And uh, these people had uh, actually met before Milosevic in Dayton, but uh, now this time they seem to be more decisive in order to stop the genocide and massive gaze and uh, massive killings. So the United States was actually a country who existed the most. So I search the one with the campaign. They saw the 
these are some photos taken from associated press. But uh, the biggest victims were the children. Because uh, this, uh, when artillery was using, uh, was uh, uh, farming villages. Children were actually terrified. But more violence and more uh, killings happened. This Kosovo Salvation Army came, became stronger and stronger because people started to think that it's the only way, the only way for, uh, for liberation. So, at least the uh, mutation guys, because they, they didn't know how to fight and they didn't have, actually they were, have, were fighting with tiny nuclear weapons against a, a well-equipped military like the one. There are some photos taken of, uh, from the criminals. This was taken from an Albanian village in Albania, close to the border, because the border was mine, and uh, uh, the soldiers tried to pass through them. And we had one case when 78 young Albanians were all killed in, this, uh, in the border. But uh, every nation had the price to pay for freedom. And this is the price that Albanian people had to pay for their own freedom. These are some photos taken after the war, actually. We have each march, uh, there are ceremonies in order to honor those who gave their life during the war. And now we have a solidarity coming from all over the world. Uh, so it's that's number one in the international agenda. We had a refugee crisis. Initially, half a million people were expelled. No, many of the biggest cost. <coughs> this is a typical refugee camp of that time. So uh, the conditions were terrible, and uh, many cases uh, there was no water, no food, and the ones who suffered the most were the children. But we had also phenomenon of uh, uh, these beautiful Albanian women uh, were called by the Serbian police and military troops. Many of them were raped, and according to the Center for Protection of uh, Children and Women of Kosovo, there were about 13,000 women raped during the war. But uh, uh, Milosevic decided to go on. He, until the diplomacy works, he was just doing his job, uh, doing kind of systematic burn of the religious. And then the women organization, they, uh, they start to, again, with peaceful means. Uh, United States of America was the country who, uh, the only country who opened an office, diplomatic office in Pristina. So women went there and they were lifting candles and uh, asking for help. So these were organized by women organizations in that time, 1998. We had sold that okay, now they start to compare Mosvich with Hitler. And because of what he did in Bosnia and Croatia, they, uh, international journalists uh, say that we should not allow him to win in, in Kosovo. And they called the campaign a genocide. So we had many international people that in help, collecting money, going in place, like some doctors and some, I mean, people of goodwill and also the organizations from the churches and from different kinds of, uh, I mean, groups. And then we had the Rechak massacre. We did it all over the world. There were a number of civilians, all civilians, children and young people, uh, and uh, old people killed. And uh, the OC ambassador of the time, called, uh, William Walker, declared, declared it a massacre. And uh, the parts in conflict were forced to go in Nambuye for a peace treaty. And it happened that uh, uh, Milosevic uh, doesn't want to sign the peace treaty. So NATO uh, starts the, uh, the air campaign. But they ruled the ground troops. And this made possible that uh, the war will last uh, more. And on the ground, there were fightings between Kosovo's Liberation Army and Serbian forces. And uh, the number of refugees arrived one million. That means uh, half of Kosovo's population. And, and 
the biggest losses were among the population. So the uh, Serbian forces used the strategy of burn time, the same that they used in Bosnia and Croatia. They were thinking that in case they managed to expel the population and then take the land and then go into this treaty, the situation on the ground will affect the negotiations and they will have the land. And uh, they also wanted not to let anything for the refugees in case they would be dead in order they couldn't live anymore there. This is a lot of Christina take, taken during the war. But finally, after 78 days of uh, uh, air campaign, Milosevic uh, gives, up, gives up and he, uh, they signed this uh, Kumanova Technical Military Agreement. But they forgot NATO authorities and uh, anybody involved there. They forgot the matter of Albanian prisoners. So Serbs, uh, they had about 5,000 prisoners, so they took them back, and uh, so they were forgotten. And uh, why they leave, why they left, they did the lost events in the villages, and also they took everything they wanted. And they were actually saying that we will be back on one day again. Have some photos of the time. And now we have NATO who enters Kosovo, peacekeeping forces, and the refugees who are hidden in different places they go to welcome it. The happiest were, of course, the children. And the uh, NATO and South Liberation Army were called the Barriers. We see German troops entering in prison, see South Liberation Army troops, and uh, after a short period of time, all over Kosovo was with peacekeeping troops. Here we see uh, an American soldier in the border with Macedonia and British troops on the right. And British troops were the first to enter Kosovo in the time, while the US aircraft did the biggest, uh, the biggest job on air. This is a US first aid helicopter who was flying over burn the ladies in cities. And I think this is the best picture of my presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, children were very, very happy. And they were thinking that now they will be free, they can work free, play freely. And the uh, soldiers got many kisses, and I think British troops got the biggest number of kisses <laughs> at the time. <laughs> now we have also uh, uh, under international protectorate, Main commission in Kosovo is called Kikor, and then we had UN who deployed there. They uh, put in a resolution called 1244, and Kosovo's Liberation Army demo demilitarized. They went in a civil organization called Kosovo's Protection Corps, who has uh, 3,000 uh, members. And then we started to build uh, bridges and render humanitarian helps and schools and so on. So. The, star, the space started to improve. But we had another phenomenon that uh, there were, as I told, about 7% of the population were Serbs. And uh, they were actually overprivileged for a long, long time. And when the military troops, the military troops, they had to leave, the police forces, they felt unsafe. And uh, they left, some of them <coughs> left with the, the Serbian troops as well. And uh, we had to, Albanian individuals who committed some revenge actions against uh, uh, certain civilians. People say that uh, this came as a consequence of Moshe, which had manipulated them. What of Serbian military troops were behind? Well, uh, they left min minefields, destruction, and massive base. Uh, uh, we have the honor and pleasure to have a forensic pathologist from uh, University of Manitoba who, be, who is here tonight. And tomorrow he will give a presentation about uh, massive graves in Kosovo. I think at around uh, 3 o'clock, so if you want to join, I'd like to see if you can see. And these are some pictures of uh, the cities. In the time, this is Fea, my city, was severely destroyed. But how, what will happen with uh, the refugees? Will they be dead? But uh, for 15 days, about half a million refugees went back, and all the roads 
that left the Kosovo are full of refugees. And uh, although some of them didn't have any house, the house was burned. They started, they, they came with energy back. Some of them went, came back also from the developed countries like Germany or Britain. But uh, what about the children? How many children do we have in Kosovo now from that? We have many of them. And uh, we, unfortunately, we don't know how much time these traumas will last. The uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, disorder is quite present among children. And while the refugees were pushed to leave, uh, and there was burnings and artillery, artillery and tanks and see military fighting, the uh, family split. And uh, many children, when they went back, they went to homes and to see if they will find the family, the ones that they lost during the war. But uh, quite many of them didn't find at all. And they still keep searching. And we have still undiscovered massive graves in Kosovo and in Serbia. Uh, this is a photo of some forensic pathologists doing the information. And now, when we had Bill Clinton, the former US president, who came in and decided to visit military troops, American military troops, and he met all the other children of Kosovo. And he had a, he said a wonderful uh, sentence. We won the war, now we have to build the peace. Now, we have the rebuilding process in Kosovo. So we passed in the uh, last part of the presentation. We have a young uh, population who started, and the older population started to rebuild the country. And uh, the first winter was extremely hard at the time because the houses were burned and uh, there was no possibility for shelter and it was very cold. So uh, we have many rheumatic diseases and also tuberculosis in Kosovo, in many cases, still. But they are optimistic. And uh, we have also international support of to rebuild the country. But what happened with those 5,000 people that we were expecting as prisoners? Uh, these are some statistics of uh, the war casualties. And uh, these prisoners, we were told that three of them are as prisoners, three thousands, and around two other thousands are lost. So that meant that they were killed some, somewhere, somewhere. Uh, one of our exchange students is a, a former prisoner. He stayed two years in Serbian jail. So in case somebody wants to know about that, you can ask him. But we had massive protests happening in Pristina because people went to the international institutions there and saying that we want our people back. Now the war is over. And Eventually, they were released after three years again after the war. And then we had the establishment of uh, SOAS institutions. People, we had our democratic uh, elections, and we have our own now our own structures, democratic structures. Well, unfortunately, they don't have that much competence. This is the president, the prime minister, and the head of the parliament. These are some governing structures. I think this is a little bit uh, irrelevant uh, situation uh, information. <laughs> uh, we have the assembly, and there are 21 uh, serves out of 120. And uh, we go towards having a, a real governing peaceful law structure in Kosovo. And we have this legal long framework, the way how they function. Now, the, the most uh, actual question that we hear in Kosovo is the standards or the status. Now people want to know what will happen with Kosovo. Are we going always to be under protectorate or we will govern ourselves, our country? And this is uh, among our biggest challenge. And uh, what we need to improve is the security situation, which uh, four years after the war is quite good, but not good enough. We have four security bodies, state for only social security service and social protection force. And politics makes quite a lot of work. Uh, the security uh, body there. And the clinical development uh, is not good because of uh, things that we will discuss now. Uh, 
process of climate change is going very slow and uh, we don't have any decision making on tax policy. There are many things that are related on uh, economics and undefined status make impossible. Uh, I mean, to have uh, agreements with other countries, to free trade agreements and so on. So, uh, unemployment is very high, 57% officially, which means that unofficially it may be much higher. And uh, we have a kind of economical monopoly. So if you travel in, so you'll find that the prices are the most expensive in all the region. That is a very bad management of the uh, UN mission there. And people are very happy, unhappy about that. And, uh, Minister of Economy and you know, doesn't have any uh, uh, any big competence on this economical thing. And we want our status to be defined because we think that the people, local people, can take care better for their own interests than the international UN people. And one reason for that is that people think that the UN as an organization is not quite homogen which means that people that work there, in many cases, they present more interest of their country they come from than of UN as an organization. And uh, we have this ongoing economical development. In case somebody wants to start a business in Kosovo, now we have a privatization process, and you can get the information there. And uh, they are quite cheap. And education is not good. We have our, our university, which is almost 33 years old, and uh, we are we want to reform our university. Especially students are very interested on that. That students sometimes cannot do that much, and it's going to go very slow, uh, slowly. But we cannot keep strong professionals there. So we have very, very good professors and doctors, but they they leave, they go in other countries to work. So they have such a small salary. This is a photo of students center in Pristina, and we have also lack of professional literature. We usually uh, learn from, I mean, English books or other books. This is a photo of the University Clinical Center and a video clip I know with some professional done because I am a professional in that field. So in the medical faculty, our teaching system we think is quite old and we don't have enough practice. And this practice that we do here is quite beneficial. So we want to have real reforms there. And now we have some exchange programs. And La Roche University from uh, six courts, they gave 21st, 21 scholarships to, uh, to uh, so as students, according to the percentage of the population. There were also Serbs and minor people, other people coming from Eritrea that are full scholarships. And uh, hopefully these 21 people will come back and will help the country. And a challenge we have the integration of Serbian minority. Uh, we want to build a country that is not like before, that doesn't uh, uh, have any kind of violence there, with make violence. That means that we have to learn to forgive Serbs and Kosovo for what they did for more than a century. And how we can do that, I don't know. And I ask for help on that. So we need to have these 7% people or 8% integrated in structures. And uh, the uh, central uh, uh, Soviet regime, they play a negative role in that because they still say that they will be back and they will have to solve that under their government. And some people there believe, so they boycott the domestic structures and the UN and take work. So we need to first uh, convince the people, Serbian people there, but at the same time, make pressure to Soviet regime or to improve the situation. And take for place a very good role. And these are children, Albanian and Serbian children, playing together. They organize multi ethnic games. And we believe that only through young people we can have a kind of substantial reconciliation because the old people, they don't think like that. Multicultural festivals. Every game that we do so. And uh, children got, uh, after the game, they were saying that well, it was wonderful. I mean, uh, we hope that through young people we can make uh, progress. And we have also monthly clinical, clinical meetings organized by Cape Force. We see medical students that serve in Albanians and not Cape Force soldiers, or Cape Force sergeants, actually. And now we have a vision for the future of our country. 
what is going to be? Is it going to be, again, a part of Yugoslavia that doesn't exist actually, or Serbia? Or will it be a state in its own? Will it be independent? And the majority of the population thinks that Kosovo should be independent country, which means that no ethnic groups or other group will be discriminated or overprivileged. That means that we have a country that resembles peace and uh, will be for everybody who wants to work and to live in. And uh, now, at the end, I, I mentioned the links between the United States and Kosovo. That is because people of Kosovo believe very much in the values that the United States uh, have on freedom and democracy of the people. And after September the 11th, uh, many Albanians went to protest in Pristina and they did several acts of solidarity and also help. And we say that we are with you, we are uh, with your values, and we believe in that. And now we are under, under, under the process of rebuilding the country, and we are working quite hard on that, but we need your help. So this uh, exchange program it was very helpful, and we think that uh, this could be uh, could get deeper and uh, broaden uh, more. So about conclusions, we believe that uh, uh, the right for self determination could be uh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, the right for self determination should be respected. And in case if that is respected, then the will of the people then will have peace. Because we cannot force a solution against two million inhabitants forever. We can do it two years, five years, or ten years, but not forever. So in case we respect the will of people, we'll have peace and we'll have development there. And economical development cannot be done without the status. It's impossible. Oh, And we should not have any kind of group over progress in Kosovo or discriminated. People should be treated the same, no matter who they are. And uh, we, it's very hard to forget the past. Simply, it was very sad. And each of us has something in our background very painful. But we believe that we can build the future. And for that, we need also international help. And in Kosovo, Amanda is a solidarity with peace and love. So I use a photo of her in this case, just to forward the message that we want the peace in the country. And we count on your help and anybody's help. Uh, I believe that many, some of you may like to read more about this, and you can uh, go to these uh, titles that are there. But also in the internet, you can find many, uh, many uh, information. Uh, I took many photos from the uh, website and the uh, music was taken from these songs. And uh, on behalf of the uh, medical faculty of Christina who appointed me to come here, I very much thank you for your attention. And uh, in case you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much indeed. describes him. His battery has been fully charged and he's been charging us up for the whole month he's been here. So thank you. Um, let me uh, introduce, why don't you have a seat over here?
Kurtishi uh, have just joined us, and so I, that's the reason I don't go. They have been here for a month. These guys are just leaving after their month. So the floor is open for anybody who might have any questions for any of the students from this over. I was uh, involved in this multi-technical multi clinical activity as organized by PHR and I was very much interested uh, uh, about the issue of the health system. So I asked about all the operatives there and there, are, there is a divided medical system which means that uh, serves have their own hospitals in the places where they live and they don't send the patients to the uh, domestic hospitals that are now administered by UN and uh, Albanians. And that means that in case they have an emergency, they barely send it in Pristina University Clinical Center. They sometimes send it in Skopje or they send it in Bulgaria. And uh, this has lamentable or terrible consequences for the patients because it takes hours to send it to the destination. And one of the things that we proposed there was that we should actually make a unique medical system because uh, medicine should be without politics. No matter what happens with politicians, patients should be treated the same. And this is a, as well a challenge for Kosovo. We hope that we will see this in the future. I don't know. I don't know if I can answer the question. Uh, yes, I like to say they are also administrated still from the changes in the healthcare system that they've seen recently and what they see for the future.
about health management. Uh, what's going on now? He's doing a uh, mass set of health management. We didn't have this before as well. Uh, then also uh, department. It's already established the department of family medicine within the Ministry of Health. And the biggest change actually for the students was that we came back in other days. And we are waiting for reports still. All right. That's about reforms. The students very much want to have reforms, and we want to have our education system and health system according to the Western standards. But this sometimes uh, these things don't go through because of, I mean, uh, the very old generation that established the university, and they sometimes think that this is not a good idea. But still, changes are happening every day, and we have seen for I think for four years in Kosovo it has happened a miracle compared to what was of the history. I mean, ten years out of the buildings and I think we are on the good way that we need to push a little more. Thank you. Could you address some of the strengths and weaknesses of your current medical education system? Yes. Oh good. <laughs> <laughs> Strength is that we very much believe on what we do. So we are very determined. I mean, we know we'll be doctors and we'll be good doctors. And we study extra hours and we read in foreign languages and we go sometimes and we just stick to some doctors, although they may be busy with plenty of patients. So we have the will and the determination. And weakness is that we don't have good practice and we don't have equipment and sometimes we don't have books. So more or less. Just as an aside, the Lear is trying to uh, develop a book project of uh, us sending uh, books over there to the so, uh, And we have connected uh, 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 some of the people, Ellis Rolat and, and our librarians, have tried to connect up the Health Sciences Library in Kosovo with Dartmouth. And we're trying to um, help. Um, the, we, we're trying to learn from them and they'll learn from us about the use of uh, internet resources and things like that, electronic library resources, uh, and so we're trying to help with that over there. Uh, I just uh, to make a more complete answer to uh, that question. Uh, if I would put it in two simple things for that question is, I believe that good thing in Kosovo is that there are a lot of good professionals there that are getting old, that is in a way a bad thing. Uh, the bad thing is that we are, we are not organized here so well. And from my experience here, I think we can, we can learn a lot from you in that aspect. As you see, we are now organizing, but for a while, but not everything on black, of course. And we do have very highly motivated students, and that's one thing that actually costs a lot of life. We have a uh, high, high rate of young population over there, and a very good young population. So there is a hope that Kosovo will develop um, in the future. And as I said, uh, we will not forget the past, but of course we will develop the future. Because sometimes it's very good to remember the past so we can then view more the future and appreciate the future. Well, I read a couple of weeks ago that the Serbian government is starting to be impatient with uh, Kosovo and trying to get it back into the Serbian government. And uh, is the, is the uh, climate there politically becoming more tense? Are people becoming more conflicted now? And when is the UN? going to leave there, and, and they set a definite deadline when the UN sort of gives over to either Kosovars or the Serbians? Uh, no, for the time being, we are waiting a new UN administrator in Kosovo, so it means that they are not leaving yet. Uh, he is a Finnish, uh, Finnish representative who is coming in Kosovo. And yes, in Belgrade, they are, the last time they are in Belgrade, they are trying actually to make some of the results where they put Kosovo within Serbia, within Serbia, but it seems that they do have a uh, negative response also from the, from the international community and EU, actually. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
function and imagination. I would like to add here that uh, actually the whole uh, situation is not that tense as it was before, but still now it's more on the diplomatic level. And Albanians are determined to have incidents, and Serbs are determined uh, the regime is determined to have to a bad. And they constantly, since NATO air campaign, they say that it was an invasion by NATO and by the international community. And the international community now, uh, they rely on this resolution 1244, which is uh, uh, under international protectorate and a piece of the uh, negotiations will start in the next two years. And uh, we got the impression that sometimes human wants to stay forever there, but uh, uh, we don't, uh, I think they eventually will move out. They are passing competences to the local authorities. And uh, when these things will start, it will be completed, we don't know. But we very much believe that the will of the people will be respected. And that means independence. And so we believe the opposite. Can I just introduce some audience members? Just take a moment to introduce some audience members who I think you might. Some of our students who are going to be going, uh, um, Jen Boyle is, is right here. Kirsten Redborg is right right there. Uh, Shumbai Zang is right up here. Um, I saw I saw some people who had, who have been there, Dane Boa, um, and there's other students who we hope will be interested in going someday. Um, there's uh, uh, the people on the on the sort of Kosovo committee. I wonder if they could raise their hands. Uh, people on the Kosovo committee. Okay, these are the people here who are who are helping to plan some of the activities in Kosovo and Kosovo. And um, you know, uh, it's been a wonderful group to work with, and, and they come up with very creative ideas. Uh, many of the people have been there, and uh, one of the things we're going to do in a little while is break up, and, and uh, people can come down to the front of the room and have some food and talk to the students and talk to the people who are going, talk to the people who have been, uh, and give us any advice that you have about what we might do about this program. Too. And then finally, it's a very special, special, special guest. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Peter Markenstein from, from uh, the University of Manitoba. Uh, actually, uh, is that right, Manitoba? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, he is a forensic pathologist, and, and he was one of um, he was one of the first uh, forensic pathologists that went in and investigated uh, some of the um, some of the um, mass genocide and, and things like that. He's going to give a presentation tomorrow to the pathology department uh, residents at three, but there's going to be another presentation later that would be to the public at five, um, especially, so, for especially for medical students if people want to hear about that. So um, he's going to be interacting with our pathology department. We've had the pleasure of hosting uh, one of the pathologists here um, uh, who has become a great friend of Dartmouth Medical School. So one of the pathologists from Pristina has been here and is our great benefactor when we go over there um, on the faculty. So where's the lecture five tomorrow? Where is the lecture we'll five? We'll do it in Strasbourg. Uh, the conference room in Strasbourg. Okay. So we, we have the Kosovo Committee meeting. Uh, yeah. so, and, and if people want to know directions, you can talk to us. Uh, uh, medicine, when Jenny Keller, who was our first medical student, went, it was particularly interesting for her coming to Dartmouth. And so it was very interesting to hear Dr. Martin say about the Kosovo. I have a question for each of you. Um, the first two guys, what are you, what are you going to take back from Dartmouth? And, and the, the second you were just adding here, what do you hope that you're going to get out of this month that we might be able to help you with? So maybe you go right down the road, Connie. What are you, you going to take back? Uh, initially, I will take back my professional knowledge. I have, I have had a wonderful week, actually, the, most, the best week I have in my life in, in clinical life, I mean, in neurosurgery. And then the other. Uh, experience that I had, I will send that back and I will share it with my colleagues. The other thing is I will organize a CTR course in Pristina for the students who will get trained all of us and we want our, the other colleagues uh, over there to know about that. We will send also some books hopefully to that. And the third thing is to make the young generation of students more powerful. That means the student voice should be heard more in Pristina. And I intend uh, one magazine that we published before that we don't have money now to publish to publish it again. It's called The Pulse, Pulse in Albania. And then we will, of course, we will not criticize too much, but we will just uh, promote the, I mean, the modern system of uh, teaching and what the students should do. And we think that the students are very powerful if they are organized. 
always looks so high, high temperature. But, uh, one of the things that I was impressed and basically left at left a uh, very deep impression was the way the, the healthcare and education is organized here. So I learned a lot and I've seen quite some some things that uh, are very very uh, essential uh, that we, we should apply there in my country. I had a wonderful experience with uh, in patient care medical team at the DHMC Medical Center and seeing that learning team how everybody learns from each other and that's one of them. Uh, another thing is is the way that students are, are engaged in activities here. Actually, I've done a survey that will be very helpful uh, in order to, to, to plan uh, the activities with other students in, in my country. And community services, uh, that's definitely one of the things that uh, we personally will, and my friends are going to think about uh, developing in my country. Uh, I would use this opportunity to, to thank to Dr. Peter Mason uh, with extraordinary experience in family practice Thank you. and also Dr. Kathleen Alden uh, from International Institute of Boston. We had a great time there and it was really something that uh, I, I didn't have to see, didn't have a chance to see, so thank you. Uh, there are a lot of people that I will come, but some of them are not present here, but these are some very unique experiences I had. And we hope that um, I hope for myself that I'm going to, to have the same experience at least as my colleagues did here in Bosnia, but of course having professional experience as we can for one month of course and strongly and healthy friendship and relationships, professional relationships and friendships with other guns. Sometimes this could have positive influence actually for the system, health system in this case. Because we have doctors who before the war ran, for example, in Germany and now they came back with a lot of experience in helping Kosovo. We have a quite surgeon who is working now in Kosovo and who is expecting to open a clinical work here in Kosovo in Kosovo and help us over there. But of course there is also a negative side of it. For example, if they go to Best that they never came back, then that's negative, of course. Uh, I believe that the rate is not very high for the time being, but uh, it might be. It might be because uh, the Kosovars were, as I said, highly motivated, also professors and doctors, but being for 10 years motivated and continuing still in freedom. I'd like to add just something about this question. I personally had uh, some two very good friends and they left. One of them went in the University of Geneva and the other one went in the University of Dusseldorf. And that is because they were extremely unhappy 
about the, I mean, the medical education that they wanted to have more interactive learning. And also, I know plenty of people who go to the University of Vienna and Graz. And actually, you know, Graz University has uh, a partnership with Pristina University. And uh, about doctors, uh, we have plenty of wonderful doctors who work outside. But uh, we don't know if they will be back. Some of them came back uh, for a short time. But the other thing is that, I mean, we have to be open and clear and going that little things. We don't think that in case they come all necessarily back would be a good idea because we'll have a conflict in Kosovo, which means we will have people employed now who may not perhaps be quite efficient as we want according to Western standards. And we will have very clever professionals and very smart professionals coming from different countries of the world. And then we think, and also this economically would be uh, not good for the country because those people support the rest of the family. But we would rather like to have these people who are outside to support, let's say, by change programs, by some equipment and so on. We, uh, I know uh, Dr. P is the chief of the department of psychiatry in University of uh, Basel. And uh, we also know many important doctors who do a good job, but sometimes their activities are not coordinated. So we would like them to work together, together with the international doctors, and help the system. I think um, what I'd like to do now is maybe end the formal um, presentation and have there's some food down in the front and have some mingling. But I wanted to make one more advertisement, uh, which is this group of students on Thursday evening at 5.30 in the hospital. Is it auditorium F or auditorium? Auditorium F. Auditorium F. F in the hospital at 5.30. They're going to talk specifically about medical student life in Kosovo, and I think that's going to be great. Um, Susie and I had the privilege of going over to Kosovo in May, and the hospitality that they, sh that they showed to the visitors uh, is just incredible. And one of the things that I'll never forget, it really touched me, was when you finished uh, talking with a person and you, and you were leaving them, they, they would always say to you, all the best. And, you know, and, and, the, and the thing is, they would really mean it. They would sort of look into your eyes and say, all the best. And so from all of us here at Dartmouth, we, we really want to say all the best to you. And thank you, Donnie, for your presentation. Thank you, all of, us, all of you, for coming up to the front of the room. And uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, at the end of Casablanca, they, they he says, round up the usual subjects. He says, uh, uh, Claude Rains uh, uh, says to Humphrey Bogart, he says, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And this is a beautiful friendship uh, that hopefully will last between um, uh, most of our Albanian friends and the Dartmouth Medical School uh, for a long, long while. So thank you very much.